for everybody. So let me uh, introduce ourselves um, and kind of the program. Today we're doing gardening with chickens and this is part of our Victory 2020 Gardens program uh, that we've been doing for several weeks now. And you can find those online. Um, if we get a chance, we'll put that in the chat box for you, the link. Uh, and then I will let you know right up front that this is being recorded and you can find this presentation uh, later as well. So if you need the slides or you wanna revisit the presentation that will be on our YouTube channel. So we're gonna have three speakers today, which is a little bit different than normal. Um, we usually only have one or two. So today we're gonna to branch out a little bit and uh, my name is Erin Harlow. I am the horticulture agent here in uh, Columbia County. Um, just a little bit of background. I have a, a fairly large garden and have for, for several years. Um, and then uh, I've been keeping chickens most of my life when I was a child uh, and then recently got back into it. Um, my background as an adult comes from working at uh, historical sites and state parks with poultry. Um, we also have Paulette Tomlinson on today, and she will. She is our livestock agent here in Columbia County. Um, she has an extensive number of birds currently uh, and has done production uh, layers. And she also runs our 4-H Laying Hen Spinners Club. So if you know of a youth that is interested in um, raising chickens and they happen to be in Columbia County, uh, we have a fun group of youth that um, are doing that for the fair. And then we also have Haley Corbett on today, and she's our family and consumer sciences agent. Uh, she has a background in health and food safety and is our go-to person for that. So she's gonna help us out uh, on that today. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, again, uh, we ask that you keep yourself muted and your video off. If you have questions, which we hope that you do, please find that chat box and put it in the chat and then we'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can practice using the chat now. Again, let us know where you're, um, where you're zooming in from. So we've got everybody from, from uh, kind of Central and North Florida right now. So find that chat box and put that in there and practice that for us uh, just to let us know where you are at. And then our outline today, um, we're going to start with kind of caring for chickens on the homestead, whether you're rural or urban. Okay, and we'll let uh, Miss Paulette do that. And then uh, we are going to talk a little bit about safety. And then we'll talk about using chickens in the garden and ideas. Okay, so we just have a couple other people come in uh, on the chat. So Merritt Island, Lakeland, uh, Costa Rica, North Carolina. Okay, so welcome everybody from all over. And uh, luckily, this topic translates very well, uh, no matter where you are. So, so I'm going to cover a little bit of history first, um, just to kind of get us in that mindset of, of using chickens in our garden and where did that come from? Okay, so the domesticated chicken is actually from um, the scientific name is Gallus gallus, and that is a bird that uh, we believe originated in Southeast Asia. You can actually see a picture of it here on the screen. Um, and it's a, a, a jungle type bird, uh, very similar to what you would see today. Okay. Um, and so we know that that's probably the main uh, background of the chicken, of our domesticated chicken. There's a couple other um, birds that have, have uh, kind of bred in over the years, um, but we've done DNA mapping on this, uh, on the domesticated chicken and that's where it, it comes from. Uh, we can trace the domesticated chicken back approximately 10,000 years, and it is considered the first domesticated animal. Um, and we think that it was spread through uh, way of India. So it started in Southeast Asia and then taken to India and then spread throughout the world uh, that way. And, and believe it or not, most of it was related to um, cockfighting. Uh, it is considered one of the oldest sports uh, and um, does go on in, in parts of the world uh, today but it was not uh, bred for the meat originally. Um, it was bred for sport. Um, the meat production actually has only been the last um, couple hundred years. So um, there actually is a picture of chickens fighting in Pompeii, uh, if you're familiar with that historic site. 
Um, so that's quite old. Um, and I found this really interesting when I was researching this, that the Egyptians actually mastered incubating eggs uh, and they kept it a secret for a really, really long time. Um, and I have a picture of how they did it. So this is a, a picture of, and, and think of a large structure. Um, the picture on the bottom is actually a hallway in the middle that the um, man could walk down and then they could open the chambers and the eggs would be on the bottom chambers. And they, they said they, they had about 50, uh, 400 eggs per chamber on the bottom and they could rotate those. Of course, they didn't have thermometers um, during the Egyptian time. So they would hold it to their cheek uh, or their lips and they could tell when, um, if the temperature was correct, they would hang um, camel dung uh, on the top chamber and, and kind of let it smolder. And that's how they regulated the temperature. Um, but these chambers, you can see them in use today. Um, and it's, a, like I said, a very old practice uh, and it was kept secret for a very, very long time, but they were breeding and incubating eggs um, during the Egyptian period. Uh, and it was quite a, 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 you know, a very long process um, and passed down generation to generation. So um, kind of interesting. I thought that was, was really neat. But these sketches, really, they didn't see, the, the rest of the world didn't see these sketches uh, until the 15, 16, 1700s. So it's an interesting history there. So we're going to let Paulette unmute herself uh, and uh, talk to us a little bit about the basics of keeping chickens and getting us going. Paulette, are you there? I am here, I think. And um, yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, this is probably my first Zoom meeting with mostly adults. Most of the time <laughs> I'm talking to uh, uh, children about their chickens and uh, we just have a good time with that. Erin, I'm glad you did all that background on uh, poultry. I, I did not. Um, thank God we have thermometers and don't have to use uh, cheeks and lips and uh, camel dung. So if we'll get started here, you're in charge of my screen. There we go. So my plan is to talk to you just a little bit about, you know, how to get started um, and then cover a little bit about nutrition, you know, your feeding and watering them because that's going to be pretty important. A little bit about free range, what does that mean? Um, and very briefly just mention to you some of the diseases and parasites and maybe some things that you can do to help. And then we're gonna talk mostly about the, the chicken coop. And I hope you have a lot of questions about different things because things can get uh, like really bread? busy really Chicks quick. Bread, please. Okay. I'm sorry, did I miss somebody? Okay, next slide. So in the beginning, when you start, I, I've talked to all different kinds of people who they, they think that they want to hatch their own birds, um, which is, that's very, very nice that we have. Um, you can see the incubator sitting there with the eggs and the uh, thermometer sitting on top. The rocker that's in there moves those eggs back and forth. Um, there's different types of, of uh, incubators that you can buy. Um, the other thing that you can do is you maybe just go ahead and buy baby chicks from a, a local hatchery. Um, we, there's a bunch all over the United States, very reputable ones uh, that have been in business a very long time. I have seen where they have started selling young pullets as well, uh, which is kind of that the little white bird there. She's probably, oh, three months old now. And then we look um, and you can see people actually sell, buy and sell full grown birds. You have to be really careful with buying whichever group you decide to start with. If you want to buy hatching eggs, that's great, but then there's problems with, with a hatch and um, uh, the incubator that you see set up is actually something we did this summer. We had about 20 eggs and we wound up with only about 10, 10 chickens and uh, because the temperature wasn't right, because we can actually regulate the temperature to the point that we can determine the sex of the bird. And um, we wound up with 80% roosters and only 20% hens, so that didn't work out so good. The baby chicks, you can buy, you can buy a straight run, which is, you know, just whatever comes out of the incubator. So you'll get a lot of roosters plus, plus pullets or, or eventually hens, females. And then for our laying hen project, obviously we buy in nothing but female baby chicks. We start from a day old and, and raise them up to laying. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
so after you decide which bird that you or which level that you want to start at, um, you start with the nutrition. You got to feed them. You got to have you know food and water for them at all times. With the baby chicks, it nutrition for poultry to me is kind of simple. Um, I leave it to the the local feed mill or the um, company Purina, Neutrina, uh, Cargill. There's several companies out there that make really good starter feeds um, and layer feeds. So I don't try to make my own mix is, is what I'm saying. Most of the diets are made up of a, a corn soybean based type diet. Uh, they'll come in a crumble fashion or maybe if you're near a local mill you can actually see the the corn and soybean mixed together. But for baby chicks you know they're little so they're not they don't eat very much so they've got to have a really high protein diet and you've only got a couple of choices here. Um, a starter feed typically is going to be somewhere between 20 and 24% crude protein, which is where it needs to be. And then you're going to have to decide, do I want medicated feed or non-medicated feed? Personally, I don't use medicated feed. I kind of like to start out with the idea that my birds aren't sick and I'm going to just try and make sure that they stay healthy the whole time. But we do have medicated feeds that are available um, that uh, put a little bit of uh, amproline um, and prolin, sorry, that is an antibiotic that helps with a couple of things. One, prevents a little bit of disease, but then it also helps encourage growth. So, but um, you're going to feed them that feed right up until they start to lay the eggs. If it's a medicated feed, there will be a tag and it will tell you when you need to, you know, have that withdrawn before you can use the eggs. So be sure and read the label um, and we'll mention that again later, but make sure that you read the label and know when you can or how long you can feed a medicated feed. Um, but we want to use that starter grower right up until they start to lay. That way they're getting as much nutrition as they possibly can. Um, and, um, and there's no, no glitches in, in growth. Poultry are some of the animals that we use a lot of times in, in actually testing different types of feeds because you can see really quickly what happens. If you lower protein, it slows growth. Um, if you add not enough mineral, uh, bones and, and feathers and things don't develop properly. So um, I, I rely on the, the educated pe people to have um, put all that work together and, and put it in a bag for us to use. Now, once the, the pullets start laying, then um, we're gonna basically feed them an adult laying ration, which is gonna be somewhere between probably 16 and 18% crude protein. Most of them hit around 17, I think. Um, that feed's gonna be a complete feed. It's gonna have all the necessary vitamins and minerals. And uh, a lot of people always worry about, um, let's go to the next slide, Aaron. A lot of people worry about the calcium levels and um, because of thin shelled eggs. And that's true, but um, thin shelled eggs are, are a problem for lots of reasons. It's the age of the bird, really older birds will start laying, they might lay an egg that doesn't even have a shell to it. Um, there could be the stage of the development of the egg within the bird. And for some reason she releases that egg sooner than um, normal. Um, and of course, nutritional status, if there's not enough calcium in the diet, uh, she could lay a thin shelled egg. And actually the picture that you're seeing is actually of an egg that it doesn't have enough calcium on it. So when I picked that egg up, my finger actually went through through it and it crumbled. The, if you can imagine, it's like crinkly paper. Um, so you see all different types of, of things that happen, but some of that can also be due to stress on the bird. Let's look at the next, next picture. This particular picture is actually of an egg that was laid, oh, the video's playing. So you can see that it's kind of rubbery. Um, it actually, uh, you can depress it and everything and it's the membrane, but there was no um, actual eggshell ever put on it, but it was laid just like that. I, I've gotten several of those over the year, um, over the years rather. So next slide. So when we talk about supplements, um, a lot of folks want to add vitamins or minerals, and, and my suggestion is don't do that. If you're buying a complete feed, um, comes out of a bag and it tells you how to feed it, feed it according to the directions. Um, 
and don't add anything to it because like I said, you can really mess some things up. Oyster shell, everybody wants to add oyster shell because they want really, really hard eggs, um, hard shelled eggs. And while that sounds good, um, actually oyster shell can potentially cause you some disease trouble. It makes, makes them somewhat more susceptible to, I want to say coccidiosis, which is a uh, um, something that young birds typically can develop and causes um, basically like diarrhea. Um, one more thing is, is about scratch feed. Everybody likes to throw out a little bit of corn or maybe th a three grain scratch or something like that and all the birds come running to you and they're, they're pecking and, and you know just having a ball. Well that's great, that's fantastic, but it's not a complete feed. Um, scratch feed is, is typically fairly cheap and if you put it out there as the only um, uh, nutrition for your birds, it runs typically about eight, maybe 10% crude protein. So they're only getting about half of the protein that they need. So you're probably not gonna have any eggs. Um, if the birds are all fully developed, that is, um, you're probably just not gonna get any eggs at all and you're gonna wonder why. So scratch feed's fun. Um, just use it as a, as a fun thing to do to call your birds to you. Next slide. So birds like to eat like birds. I mean, that's what they do. They like to eat all day long. They'll eat a little now, they eat a little later. And so you need to have both your feed and clean water available all day, every day. That's the key to really good poultry egg production. Um, there's lots of different types of feeders and waters. You can buy anything from a pint size jar um, up to, um, well, the, the feeder in the middle, uh, the gray cylindrical uh, feeder is actually a range feeder. It will hold 300 pounds of feed. And in our operation, when we, we used to run anywhere between 300 and, and 600 birds, um, we had two or three of those outside uh, protected from the cows, but um, outside for the birds to, to run around and, and they could eat anytime they wanted to as well as free range all day. Um, most folks like to start out with maybe a tray feeder, which is there to the left. And it's got, you know, little spaces for their, the baby birds to put their head into. Those get to be aggravating as the birds get older because they need more and more food. And so we use hanging feeders and I've got pictures of those later on. Um, but there's lots of different ways to feed them. It's just a matter of how much aggravation do you want to go through every single day of making sure that they got plenty of food and water available. The water up in the top right hand corner shows, you know, it's about, a, that's a gallon size feeder um, water. And so birds like to get in that. So they'll step in it um, and it gets really nasty. So you got to clean it out. Um, it'll probably grow algae in it and that sort of thing. So you really got to clean it out good. Um, I like automatic watering devices. And again, I'll show you some pictures of those when we get to the coop section. But automatic watering devices are, are fantastic. Um, you don't have to do all the scrubbing and stuff that you have to do with some of the individual type watering systems. Um, so they're, but they're easy to clean, dump it out, maybe have a scrub brush and clean it out a little bit once once a month maybe. Um, and the nice thing is unless the electricity goes out, it never runs out. So you don't have to worry about it. Next slide. So what exactly is free ranging? I mean, that's really what everybody wants to do. We see it on cartons of eggs and stuff in the store. Um, free range eggs are described or, or um, talked about in such that they're supposed to be better eggs. I'm not sure that that's the case. I'd like to think that they were because we used to sell so many. But um, free range only means that they, that the birds actually have access to the outside. Now, if you live up north and it's the dead of winter and you've got um, uh, freezing temperatures outside, I'm kind of doubting that your birds, if you open the door, that they're going to go outside. They're really not going to want to do that because um, they can't heat themselves very well. So that could be an issue. But that is what free range is. It's just access to the outside. Should you do it? That's up to you. It depends on where you live and how much space you might have. Um, you can build a run. I don't have a picture of a run, but there's lots of pictures out there for you to look at on the internet. You can build a, a really small um, 
run that your chickens can can get out and and play in and uh, or even just let them out in your backyard if your restrictions and all that kind of stuff in your um, if you live in a subdivision if they allow that if you have a homeowners association uh, if you're in town you definitely need to check with the, you know the rules and regulations of the, of the city sometimes they'll allow you so many birds but then they have to be kept in a particular size coop and and those kinds of things so watch out for that for gardening um, I would believe that our hope is that um, that the bugs are going to get eaten. Uh, this was a poor pitiful tomato plant that was um, kind of late in the season, I guess. And you can see the hornworms that totally denuded it and the stink bugs that are eating away at the tomatoes. Um, we'd like to think that the chickens would come in and, and take care of those before any of that happened. But I'll let Erin mention some of that with um, what she's found. Next slide. So the thing about free ranging is that you have to be careful with letting your chickens out because pretty much everything that can eat them will. If you, if you live in town and you think, well, I, you know, there's really not anything around that's going to bother my chickens. Well, there still might be. If you've got a tree, maybe there's a snake that could be there. Um, if you've got little tiny birds, snakes can be a problem for, for small birds. Um, maybe you've got coons that visit that you don't know about. They're not getting into your gar garbage, but uh, they will get into a chicken pen and they will take care of all your chickens. Uh, possums, hawks, eagles, owls. Um, we've had all those problems and more. Coyotes. So free ranging is not as, as much fun for the birds as you would think. Um, it, it can be preyed upon quite easily. Um, and yeah, there's other places that can be a problem in the garden. Um, there's different types of, of vegetables that you can grow that could cause them to be sick if they eat too much. My experience with um, plant poisonings or poisonous plants rather is that pretty much everything's poisonous. It's just a matter of how much you eat of it or the animal eats of it. So birds are kind of small so they don't necessarily have to eat a whole lot before it could cause them a problem. The picture there is actually of creeping indigo, which is toxic to all plants, I mean to all animals that eat it. It's a small uh, ground cover type plant that runs along the ground and you can see the, the uh, flower and everything, how small the leaves are. But they'll eat the seed pods and, and die very quickly from that. Next slide. So our diseases and parasites, you can see here that there's several different types of diseases that they can get. Um, avian influenza, um, and yes, even the one that can be transmitted to humans, so you have to be careful. Haley's going to talk probably a little bit about, you know, making sure that you're safe um, while you do have your birds. Merrick's disease, Newcastle, um, Eastern neckline encephalitis, and there's a few others. There's a complete list uh, I'll show you in the reference references at the end of my talk here that uh, where you can go and read more about those diseases and, and what to look for. Parasites. Uh, Birds are really pretty easily uh, prone to getting mites. They'll, they could be on their head, uh, around the vent area, the tail vent area, and then on their legs. Uh, stick type fleas, those are really a pain. Fleas don't typically bother our farm animals and stick type fleas are the only flea that will affect chickens. Uh, if you have dogs and cats and they stay outside and you think they might have fleas, you might want to try and control the fleas before you ever get birds and make sure that you control fleas on them and keep them away from from your birds because the stick type fleas can be a real problem and there's not a lot that we can do about it and then there's lice you don't have to worry about that lice getting on you um, and staying on you it's not a human lice um, it's it's specific to uh, poultry um, but if you're handling the the birds a lot it, they definitely can get on you and, and cause you some aggravation for a period of time so control, there's really not a lot you can do. In our free range egg operation that we ran for over 20 years, um, we couldn't use anything. So when we had a bird that, that got sick, it just got sick and died, um, or we dispatched of it in some way. Because most of our antibiotics or any of our um, mechanisms to try and control disease or parasites, they come with restrictions. And one of the main restrictions is that you can't use any of the eggs 
while those animals are on that. And then sometimes they don't even have a withdrawal time. Um, it just says you can't use it for laying hen operations. We did try some of the diatomaceous earth. Um, if you read actually how much diatomaceous earth actually has to be fed to the birds, um, I don't think they'll eat the feed if you put that much diatomaceous earth in there to try and control intest internal parasites. As far as external parasites go, we used it a little bit. That's how we did it. We would actually sprinkle it around, um, kind of put a layer out as the birds all went to bed so that whenever they got up in the morning, they had to walk through it, track through it, and, um, and that's what we did. So the best thing to do is actually prevention. Um, and a word that we don't talk a lot about and we should be probably more having more discussion about is biosecurity. Biosecurity means keeping everything clean but it also means not commingling new birds with your older birds. It could be that if, you're, if you've got two different sets of, of birds, one set that's close to your house and maybe you've got a, a small farm and so you've got some on the other five acres, um, maybe those birds don't even need to commingle because what they've been exposed to, the other group had not been. Uh, in commercial poultry operations, going from one house to the other, those uh, farmers are actually having to disinfect between houses. That's how uh, easily disease can be spread and they know that so they, they use a lot of bi biosecurity measures to, to prevent any kind of disease from moving from one, hat, from one barn to the next. The other thing is really buy from a reputable hatchery or a farm. Many of the farms are inspected. Uh, they can show you all the uh, uh, certifications that they would have and be able to you know let you know that yep my farm's clean and I don't have these particular diseases. You can also purchase vaccinated chicks. You can ask for um, for the birds to be you know vaccinate, vaccinated against Merrick's disease um, and there's a few other vaccines that some of the hatcheries offer, offer. The biggest thing that you can do and I say this with any animal production operation is watch and check the animals that's the easiest thing to do. It's easy to tell when an animal is not feeling well when you know what a good healthy animal looks like. Um, you can see them being off by themselves, uh, head down, lethargic, and then maybe you need to move that animal to a sick pen. That would be the best thing to do. Let's move on. So now this is the fun part. This is building the chicken coop. Let's go on. Oh, I need to hurry here. So, for our operation, we would buy in uh, 100 to 200 baby chicks at a time to replenish the stock that we had. And so we had brooder type pens that we built. Notice that there, it's up off the ground. Um, it's a wire mesh floor. We use quarter inch welded wire as the, the floor bottom. And then the sides were actually used, um, I think it was one inch uh, or maybe one and a half inch of the poultry netting which is a, a little less expensive. And we use that for the sides and the top. This is two separate sets of birds that we're using. We got turkeys on the right. If you can look in the, the picture to the left, you'll see the turkeys to the left, I mean, sorry, to the right. And then the, actually the little birds that we hatched, you can see all the nice roosters and the two little hens that were in there that were left over. Next pin, I mean, next slide. Maybe you want a house type and you know, these are bigger because we obviously had larger number of um, birds, but you can build these, you know, smaller. One of the things that, that you'll notice on most of the pens that we do have is um, the use of tin around, around the bottom. And the reason for that is because every kind of, like I said before, predator will, will try and reach in and grab um, grab your birds either from the bottom or from the side and they'll scare the birds um, at night especially and make them run around until they can catch them and uh, coons and possums are really bad about climbing and being able to stick their hands in there and, and grab that bird and try and pull it through the wire so so we use a lot of tin and it's actually fairly cheap to do that and then we can use a, um, a wider uh, like on that particular barn that's two inch uh, by four inch um, no climb fence type wire. Uh, inside you'll see the automatic waters that we, I'm sorry, the, the automatic water down there, it's a large tub, and then the roost over there uh, to the far left. 
And again, the floor is built with um, the use of quarter inch welded wire. Next slide. Maybe you live out and you've seen Joel Salatin's information about um, mobile units. You know, have you moved your pen today? Well, this is a mobile unit that actually can be pulled with a, a tractor or a truck. The nest boxes um, are on the sides. Uh, it's not here. On, this is on the back side. The door's on, on the other side. Uh, obviously, we had to protect the birds from some northerly winds and some rain, so we, we covered it up with um, just a tarp. Those are the, some young pullets now that we're raising. Um, there's about 30 of those. We've got some black osterlorps, some Issa browns, and some uh, white leghorns. Again, they've got plenty of roost area, plenty of space. And as we're talking about space, um, inside you want to provide about three to four square feet of space for your birds. And then outside, if you decide that you want to have a run, you're going to need about 10 square feet per bird. And that's all up to you as to how much space. You, if, if you put them in smaller spaces, um, poultry are very cannibalistic and they'll pick on each other to the point of um, causing death. Next slide. Um, this was one of the barns. Was, our large operation is basically out of commission. We've, we've only got about 60 plus those 30 young pullets coming, but um, so about 100 birds, I guess, total. But we've only got about 60 layers right now. Um, and we've got them in that, that first green barn. But this was a, a barn that we built that we could probably house, I think about 300 birds um, in that house. And um, you can see we used the 10, two rows of 10 all the way around. Uh, those big double doors in the front would be open. We would shut, because of the woods around, we always opened, um, opened the barns up in the morning and shut it up at night. Uh, we had to use cattle gaps or, or cattle gates around our big free range feeder so that the cows wouldn't get into those and knock those over, causing a big problem. So that's what those bigger gates are for. Um, they were not to keep the birds in by any stretch. I don't know if you can see it or not, but we used a, an owl outside to try and keep the hawks away, a fake owl. Um, and that worked for a period of time until the great horned owl that was actually living on the place decided he didn't like uh, that owl being in his territory. So then that owl moved in and began to kill our birds. Um, next slide. When you're thinking about designing your coop and it, you can see this in some of the pictures that I've, I've shown and you can see later, um, you, you want it to be very well ventilated, especially here in Florida, you're talking about some really hot days and birds can, can have some heat stress going on. And anytime you have heat stress or any kind of stress, um, production can lag. So you want to Locate it someplace, maybe where the um, there's a nice breeze, if you can do that. If you want it under a tree, that's fine. Uh, just know that you might have a, a snake or two or, or some other, you know, possum or coon that might be in that. Um, that might help you decide, you know, that location may be good or may not be. Uh, when you are thinking about location, again, make sure that you're following restrictions of whatever your um, homeowners association or maybe, you know, if you're in an urban setting uh, or your uh, local city ordinances and even county ordinances. I've had calls over the years with people calling and saying that my neighbor's ro rooster is crowing, what can I do about it? And uh, they were living in the country at the time and there really wasn't much you could do. Uh, the size of the pen, again, uh, your hens are going to need somewhere around three to four square feet inside if you're just building a, a coop inside. Uh, for outside, you want to provide them about 10 square feet. And keep in mind that if you have a run that is attached to your building, your coop, you're going to run into a situation where they're going to totally denude the, that property. Uh, you won't have a blade of grass left in that run if they have access to it all the time. Uh, that's just a, the nature of chickens. They will totally wipe it out. And because of that, then you're going to have perhaps a muddy area. So you might want to think about that when you think about where to put it. The materials, uh, I like, we like to use the tin, but you can use um, wire. Um, you could use boards. Boards aren't, you know, some sort of perm uh, or non permeable material down at the bottom of your pen would be good, or raise it up off the ground high enough so that you know that the animal can't get to it. And then welded wire works well. Uh, poultry netting works good. You just need to know what size birds you're putting into that so that 
Uh, you don't get the, um, like you can't use two inch poultry netting when you've got baby chicks that you're putting into it. And remember that baby chicks are gonna require a lot of heat early on when they're growing. Uh, next, I think this will be, yeah. So these are the hanging feeders. Um, and you can see down at the far end where the nest boxes, we purchased nest boxes. Those were um, 12 whole units. Uh, they were six by six. Those are typically, you wanna raise those up off the ground three, three feet or so. Uh, high enough, birds like to fly up to fly into their nest box and they want something nice and cozy. So you want to have a, um, uh, you can put hay in, in the nest box. The nest, the nest box size is probably going to be somewhere around eight inches wide to say maybe even 10 inches or even a foot uh, deep. And you'd kind of like it to uh, sink down a little bit, meaning that the, the, there's a two or three inch step into, um, into the nest box. And uh, that makes them feel nice and cozy. You want it in a, a, a darkened area. That's the reason why we had the tarp up on that end so that it would make it darker down there. As far as the nest material, you can use hay. They also sell um, AstroTurf type material. Um, it's actually the stuff that you used to use to um, scrape your feet off when, before you walk into, the, um, into your house, you know, kind of thing. That stuff works good. And it's easy to clean. It's plastic and it's easy to clean. Hay can be a problem. Um, next slide. So in conclusion, um, make your choices, you know, early on, you know, what, what type of chicken are you going to buy? Um, maybe you want a, a, a meat chicken, uh, our broilers, they grow really quick, be a real quick project, four to eight weeks. Um, decide, you know, how many birds you're planning on getting. Remember that nutrition is, um, is really key to, to good production. Clean food and water available at all times, regardless if they're free ranging or not. And then you wanna watch your birds, watch your birds, watch your birds, because that's how you know what's going on with them. Uh, don't forget, pick a good coop location. If you need any help with any of that, let us know. Uh, and enjoy your new project. And then the next slide, this is where most of I would tell you to go um, to this website. Uh, this is Extension's website basically for the entire country. They've got things on there where you can ask um, the expert and you will get um, somebody from around the country that knows about chickens to answer whatever question you might have. If you're here in Florida or even if you're not, we have a brand new IFAS publication um, about raising backyard chickens for egg production. And um, it tells you some of the do's and don'ts and covers probably some of the same stuff that I'm talking about now a little more in depth. And with that, thank you, Erin. Thank you all. Sure. Thank you, Paulette. Um, so before we, we turn over to Haley, I'm gonna put up some poll questions. Uh, let's see. And so you can answer those and we'll see, um, we'll give you just a few minutes, see if you're paying attention. And, uh, and it's asking, do you currently have chickens? Yes or no? Looks like we're about half. Oh, about 50-50. Okay, almost everybody's voted. So there's your results there. Do you currently have chickens? About 55% said yes. 45% said no. So we might change your, uh, your, uh, your mind. Okay, hold on, I wanna go to the next one. Uh, let's see, and polling, there we go, hold on. There we go, and, oh, not that one, this one, there we go. All right, how do you garden with your chickens? Do you free range, let them in the garden, don't let them in the garden, chicken tractors, pens, or other? I should have put on there, I don't have chickens. <laughs> so this is for those that do have chickens. So while we're, while we're doing that, we did have a question that came in, um, Paulette, 
Uh, do you recommend a breed for Florida and kids? Um, I will tell you that I have Issa Browns and that's through the 4-H project. Um, and you will see them <laughs> multiple times um, when we get to my section. Uh, they're a smaller breed and they're uh, known to be pet friendly, kid friendly. So they've been really good so far. Um, but I think it's personal choice. Paulette, do you have any um, thought on that? No, it really is personal choice. I mean, there's um, a lot of people say that Rhode Island Reds are, are kind of, they're big and, and they tend to be nasty. And I've never had that experience with them. Um, roosters, you can have problems with roosters. That would be the biggest thing that I would be more concerned with. With hens, um, it's a personal preference and there's a thousand different breeds. So just pick what you like. There's good egg layers. The Issa Browns are what we use this year for the Laying Hen Project. And um, I think they're working out really quite well. Yeah, we've enjoyed them so far. Um, so I've got one more on here and this is before we talk about the eggs. So if you do collect eggs, which I will tell you mine are not big enough yet. So um, we don't have eggs yet. But if you do, um, how do you collect them? And then how do you store them? I'm just reading your comments. Let's see. Um, yeah, so Joanne built a chicken powered compost bin. These are, these are pretty awesome. Um, they get via the hidden chicken tunnel that runs from the coop pen to the enclosed compost bin. So that's pretty cool um, that they can just run back and forth. And then uh, we've got Donna in Costa Rica said that they, her chickens free range and they eat bugs and ants and, and things. Uh, yeah, ours don't lie yet either, Marion. They're too little. Soon though. Okay. Let's share the results there. So it looks like most of the people are collecting once a day uh, and then they don't wash them. Um, you can, I should have said you could choose more than one. Uh, some are storing them in the fridge counter. So that just gives you an idea when we talk about this, think about how you're, how you're collecting. Um, so Haley, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, we're gonna let Haley uh, Go ahead and start with food safety for your eggs. All right, so food safety for your eggs. It was interesting uh, reading y'all's answers to those questions. Um, and so that you know, I'm coming from a complete food safety perspective. Um, and I've heard from people, well, that's not, you know, realistic or those type of things. Well, we'll tell you that uh, the reason I teach these things is because whether you think it's really realistic to go several times a day or not, there's reasons that you should. So to start with, we're simply just going to talk about the food safety principles, okay? And this is for any food that you consume, not just eggs, okay? So the four principles that you should always think about are clean, separate, cook, and chill, as you see here. So clean has to do with your hands, any surfaces that you use, anything that any type of food touches, uh, utensils, cooking pots, a counter, anything like that. Then you have your separate. So when it comes to the eggs, like it's not as big a deal as we're collecting them, like to separate the eggs from each other. What's important is, is when you're actually using them to prepare something or something like that to make sure that you don't um, put them with another food uh, such as meat or something that could contaminate them or them contaminate another food. So it's keeping those kind of things in mind. Um, the third one is cook and this is talking about the proper temperatures. Um, we'll get a little more into that but you know all those uh, what is it over easy eggs? Eh, you know you're, you're playing with fire a little bit there just letting you know okay and then chill. Um, that one was an interesting thing on y'all's poll too about who chills them and who doesn't. Um, but your food uh, should always be chilled if it's something um, that has time and temperature issues and eggs are one of those. So we'll focus completely on eggs here um, and we're going to talk about the different elements of that. So collection, cleaning, um, the next slide will have storage and consuming. So for collection, you know, I understand your one time a day. I've heard Many people say, you know, it's easier just to go get them one time a day. That way it doesn't, you know, mess with them while they're trying to do everything and everything else. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. Eggs are time and temperature specific 
and they grow bacteria. So the reason we even care about this is salmonella is one of the biggest bacteria. I know Paulette mentioned, um, mentioned something else and it is possible for them to transfer things to you. Um, but the biggest one that we see and the most common is salmonella. And salmonella, actually, a lot of people used to assume that, and still assume sometimes, that it's just on the outside of the egg. So you don't have to worry about it. But actually, they've proven now that it's been around so long that it's actually in the ovaries of some of the chickens as well. So when they, ha or when they have the egg, it could already be inside of the egg without you even doing anything. So these are things that you want to think about. Why do we care about salmonella? Um, well, because it's a foodborne illness and it can give you a lot of issues, okay? So um, for normal people, you know, not high risk populations, typically you don't really see a big deal about it. You know, you might get some um, stomach pains or some vomiting or diarrhea or maybe a fever, but nothing, you know, too major. If you're in one of those high risk groups, it tends to affect you a little more. Um, and if you get dehydrated, that's of course an instant thing where you need to go to the hospital and, um, make sure that you're taken care of. So, and the thing is, is a lot of people are like, well, how do I know if I have it? Well, depending on the foodborne illness, but salmonella, it's somewhere between six hours and six days after you've eaten it that the symptoms will appear. Um, everybody's a little bit different, and those are the things to kind of think about. So, you want to make sure that you, again, think about that egg. So, the bacteria can be in an uncracked whole egg, just like I said, because if it's already in the ovary, um, of the chicken, then it's already inside of the egg itself. Um, the difference between your ones at home and your ones here. So I'm gonna go to cleaning. When they come from a plant or you buy them at the store or anything like that, it's a huge processing place, okay? And those are the things that I like people to remember. Um, I teach like canning and stuff too, and I get lots of questions about, well, you know, they use these woozy bottles. Why can't I can into woozy bottles? Well, the difference is, is how the plants are set up. We at home are not set up the way that they are with their extreme temperatures and all of their extra things that sanitize and make sure that they're safe. We at home have our basic things that we have going on. So when you think about that, you have to think about how to clean your eggs at your house and what's the safest for you. So biggest thing, no matter what, across this whole thing, and you're gonna see it on every slide if you don't already see it here twice, is wash your hands, okay? Salmonella, you can get it from the egg, from touching it, collecting it, touching your face, you just got infected. You didn't even eat the egg yet, but guess what? That salmonella got to you, okay? So before you collect the eggs, you should wash your hands because you never know what's on your hands beforehand. After you collect the eggs, you should wash your hands. And any time you touch the egg after that, you should wash your hands before and after, no matter what. The other thing is, is you should collect those eggs two to three times a day. Why? That time and temperature thing. Eggs should only be out of, or should only be at temperatures above, um, uh, well, actually, they like them to keep them around 40, but if you go to 120, that's where that uh, unsafe zone kind of gets, and if they're above 120 for more than two hours, they should be thrown out completely, because that gave that salmonella time to multiply inside of that egg, which is going to make you sicker. Um, there, it, it can be present and cannot make you sick if you cook it effectively, but if you don't get it all the way or it gets too much because it had that time to grow, it can still affect you. The other thing that you want to make sure of is you always want to examine the shells. So I know Paulette talked a little bit about like the thin shells and those type of things, but when you're collecting them, you want to make sure that there's no cracks. Um, you want to make sure that they look good, you know, all those kind of things. Because if not, if there's any type of crack or anything like that, that's also letting that bacteria in and letting um, factors in that can create more. Um, cleaning. So I read that half of you wash them and half of you don't. So I will tell you that there is kind of a controversial on this, um, but the research says that you should not, okay? Um, I've read in other countries that they don't necessarily put there. I haven't found any research that actually supports that either, that not of uh, washing them to be better, okay? So the reason you don't want to wash them is because eggs actually have a protective layer over them when they come out of the hen. So when you wash them, you take off that protective layer, which now allows the porous um, eggshell to let other things in. And it lets that time, that temperature, and all that bacteria that may have not have been in that egg inside of there. So those are the things that you have to think about. I was going to tell you that one in every 20,000 eggs are contaminated with salmonella. So that sounds like a lot, 
but it's not a crazy amount. Um, it's actually very low, but it's something that you want to think about because it can affect you. So making sure that you clean the shells is something that you want to do, but not with water. So the best way to clean them is using a dry method, which is a brush, a cloth, or like fine sandpaper. And you're just kind of wiping them down to make sure that you get everything off of them um, and making sure that you still leave that protective layer. So even then you can't like be all forceful on it, trying to get every little piece off. That's why they said use the fine sandpaper instead of the real grit so that you mess everything up. Next slide, please. So the next part of this is storage. Okay, so again, this is a time and temperature food, so it should always be stored in the fridge. Okay, always be stored in the fridge. I know, I know, I've met many people. I have actually a friend who swears that she's always stored her eggs on the counter and that she's never had any issues. But what I will tell you is, is back when our grandma's grandma and all the generations before, Salmonella was not inside of the chickens. It was just something that got on the outside from their poop, from those type of things. Now they've proven that it's inside of them and you don't know, they show no signs, no symptoms, no anything, it's just there. So those are things that you have to think about. So make sure that when you store them, you refrigerate them. They should be refrigerated at 40 degrees or less. That is the temperature in which keeps that time and temperature safe for you, for the bacteria not to be able to multiply and make you sick. The other thing is, is you're going to want to use some type of container. An egg carton, of course, is the easiest possible, um, but you just want to put them in there. And part of that is too, is you don't necessarily want other foods in your fridge to contaminate them. You know, if you touch them as you're pushing in and out, if your eggs are just sitting on the shelf in there, or um, if you touch it with your hand and you didn't wash your hands, or if you touch it with your hand, even though you wiped it down, but then you go touch something else, you could have spread it there. So again, hand washing is an important thing. <coughs> The other thing that you have to think about is storage. So if you get your eggs um, from your garden, uh, hold on just a sec, sorry. Okay, so if you get your eggs from your backyard, your garden, your coops, wherever you're picking them up from, you can keep them for four to five weeks as long as you keep them at that proper temperature and everything else. That's uncooked, okay? Honestly, when you get them from the store, it's the same way. And if you read the carton, it actually has a sell-by date on it. And normally that sell-by date is going to expire somewhere in that four to five weeks of when the eggs were done, but the eggs are still typically good, okay? Um, they put that typically, most places do it around three weeks is when that expiration will happen. That's not every single one, but that's the typical. So you actually have a little bit longer to consume them. This is uncooked. Now, when you cook them, it becomes a whole different thing, okay? So we're gonna swap over to consumption and then we'll talk about the storage of the, of after you consuming them afterwards. So consumption when I want to eat them. I mean, that's the whole purpose of what we're doing, right? So again, wash hands before you get them out. After you crack them and put them all in your bowl for scrambled eggs or whatever kind you want, wash your hands again because chances are there might still be something on that shelf. And if you touch all the other stuff in your kitchen, you've now spread the bacteria. You want to inspect them again. I know you inspected them when you picked them up and you put them in your fridge, but make sure that nothing happened. I mean, I have two children and my eggs are in an egg carton. But I will tell you that sometimes they go in the fridge and if they drop something in the fridge, they're not going to tell mom that they dropped something in the fridge. They're just going to pick it up and keep going. So if they drop it on top of that egg carton, it could have cracked an egg. And that's something that was different from what I originally put in there. <coughs> the other thing is, is you don't want to consume raw eggs, okay, of your own. If you do need a raw egg for different things, there's lots of different like holiday sauces and um, things like that that use raw eggs, you want to make sure that those eggs are actually pasteurized, okay? And they do sell those in the store that you can use. So like Caesar salad dressing, tiramisu, all of these are um, things that use raw eggs, but you want them pasteurized so you know that they are safe to put in there raw. Anytime you're consuming your eggs, they should always be cooked to 160 degrees, especially casseroles, scrambled eggs, anything like that. We talked about those sunny side up eggs earlier. Um, I know a lot of people eat them. My husband's one of them. 
Um, but I will tell you that every time you do that, you're technically at risk. In a restaurant, you're typically at less risk because they do use pasteurized eggs, knowing that that is something that people um, want. And so they make sure that they cover their butts. When you're at home, just think about it. You really want the yolk and the white to be firm. That's how you know that it's good. Now we'll go back to storage, okay? Oh, sorry, I'm almost done, Erin, I promise. So after you cook the eggs, you have to think about what you're gonna do with any of the leftovers too. So any of those sauces, anything like that. Like I said before, eggs should never be at room temperature for more than two hours. <coughs> so if you are cooking a casserole, making uh, the holiday sauce, anything like that, even though they're pasteurized, you should still make sure that within two hours that that food, that anything is back in the fridge, okay? And then after, you know, cooking, you know, that can make a difference too. Oh, the other one I always like to add is we talk about two hours at room temperature. Well, we all live in Florida, okay? So if I go to a picnic and I take egg salad or potato salad with the eggs in it, and it's out, well, I don't know what's the temperature today, probably 95, 98, somewhere around there, really feels like 100. If it's above 90 degrees, anything with egg product in it should be thrown away after one hour. Throw it away. The one thing I'll tell you about food safety is I get questions and things like that all the time. It is always better if you question it to just go ahead and throw it out because it's gonna make it safer for you in the long run and make you where you are not sick. So food safety is important in the whole process of this, okay? Like I said, from collection to cleaning to storage and consuming, it's not just when you're cooking it. You have to think about these principles throughout the whole thing. And the biggest one to remember is wash. Wash your hands and wash everything that touches it. That is the biggest principle to take from this. Thank you, Haley. So while we're, while we're thinking about um, food safety, I just wanted to mention um, one thing that I tell my kids all the time, you know, she's talking about egg collecting, but when you're working in your coop as well, uh, you need to think about washing your hands um, before and after you work with your chickens. Uh, if you're working with the manure, if you're doing composting, which we'll, we'll talk about now, um, make sure that you're washing your hands. The other thing that I've, I've got kids as well, um, and our chickens are very sweet, so we tend to hug on our chickens, is I'm constantly telling my daughter, don't kiss the chickens, <laughs> which sounds funny, but she's four. So um, she does like to do that quite often. So I, I'm constantly telling her, please don't do that. Uh, you know, don't, don't love on the chicken that much. So now we're gonna talk about the fun stuff uh, that I really like. Um, and I, I realize we're right at 12, so we're gonna go over today. So if you do need to hop off, uh, we understand we are recording this for you, okay? So we want to talk about being realistic. Um, you know, if you if you Googled having chickens or having chickens in your garden at all, um, you're going to come up with these beautiful Pinterest photos of chickens wandering nicely through gardens, and the garden is beautiful, and it all looks happy, and everybody's happy. Um, but that's not usually what it's like when you garden with chickens. <laughs> so, so I want to make sure that we're... Uh, we're being realistic when we talk about keeping our chickens and our gardens. So just some reality checks. If you do wanna have your, your chickens in the garden, um, and you can see these are some of my girls here in this picture, uh, they are going to eat newly sprouted plants and seeds. If you've planted seeds, uh, they'll go dig them up for you. Uh, if they just sprouted, they will taste them for you, okay? Uh, if you have new fruit, they will usually eat that as well. Uh, they do like to dig, uh, and that's one thing. I've got the Issa Browns that I was warned about that uh, that breed likes to dig holes uh, more than others. Uh, so that's what they're kind of doing here is creating little dust baths that they're, they're doing. Uh, and they do like to strip uh, plants of leaves as well. Now, I have mine in my garden, and um, Mine actually haven't been that bad yet. Uh, you can see there's actually, this is Florida Pusley uh, in the picture, that's a weed, but that is one of their favorite plants. And so they actually eat that and the crabgrass first. So, um, and now is, we'll talk about timing, but now is when I want them in the garden. So timing is really important when we're talking about chickens. If you want to incorporate them in the garden, 
um, we don't usually recommend having them in the garden all the time. And that's really, again, for that, that, that safety, um, having the manure um, around the, the products that you're gonna eat. So when you're looking at your plants, uh, they need to be big enough to survive the chickens, uh, but before they set fruit. Okay, so there's a little window in there of when you, when you can let them out into that garden. You might want to consider blocking sections off um, and or planting plants that fruit at the same time. So you can put in some some fencing and we'll, we'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Uh, just to kind of keep them in an area. Now it really depends on your chickens though, because some of your chickens, um, you might have some that just fly all the time. You know, and they're gonna fly over that fencing. Uh, but then you might have some that are well behaved and that might be the, the set that you want in the garden. And then I always let mine out um, when my season's done. So we're in Florida, um, my garden is really, I'll show you in a picture, uh, it's, it's done now. So they're, they're allowed to wander. Um, our North Carolina friends that are on, uh, your garden might not be done yet, so you might not want your chickens out there quite yet. So this is an example, okay? This on the left hand, this is my daughter and our dog in the garden. Uh, and this was earlier in the season. So you can see this is, it looks nice. This is not when I'm going to put my chickens in the garden uh, because they will ruin everything. On the right hand side is the same garden now, okay? Um, you can see I've kind of let the weeds grow up. Everything's kind of done uh, besides the loofahs. Uh, and of course the chickens are not where I want them to be. I want them in the garden, but that's not where they are. So you also probably will never have your chickens where you want them uh, unless you fence them in. Uh, we recommend keeping it a girl thing. Uh, so again, your chickens are all gonna be different. You might try your young hens, which is typically um, what most people recommend. Um, but you might have a set of older ones that, that uh, are, are, again, not wanting to wander too much uh, and they'll be fine in the garden. So you're gonna kind of have to test out your group. Okay? Uh, we recommend omitting broody hens because they'll start laying eggs in your garden and that's not fun. Uh, roosters tend to distract the girls, although they are good for, um, you know, keeping, protecting the, 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 uh, the, the girls, okay? So they'll, they'll sound off if, if something's coming, predator or whatever. And then hens and chick sets do get separated, and then all you'll hear is peeping all day long. So, um, and they get stressed out that they can't find mom. Um, so uh, I would leave those in the coop, okay? So chickens are wonderful manure machines. So this is why a lot of us have chickens, okay, is to really help the garden. I mean, the eggs are nice, but um, I, I'm a gardening person, so you know they're, they're there to help me. So did you know that a hen can produce eight to 11 pounds of manure a month? Uh, that's about 130 pounds uh, in one year. Now that is, um, that's wet weight, okay? So once it's dried, it's about 51 pounds. That's a lot of manure. So you wanna compost it, um, and we'll give you a couple of tips on how to do that. But the, the really important thing in, uh, is to allow that it sits for 120 days. So if you're going to have your chickens in your, your garden at the end of the season, like I'll have mine in now, um, but, but if I don't give it 120 days, that's, that's really the magic number for safety, okay? Um, for that manure to break down and also making sure that I don't burn my plants with nitrogen. So uh, if you're going to have them out in the garden all the time, you want to really give it 120 days. Um, and which is a little bit easier if you're, if you're up north, for instance, and you have a, a really low period. Um, our gardens are, are going to go fallow now here in Central and North Florida. You can consider a deep litter coop method. And so what this means is if you're somebody that's not letting your chickens out in the garden, but you still want to use that compost, this is going to be key for you. So in your coop, you can layer um, leaves or hay, and then um, that's, you, you know, put under the roost um, where they're going to be walking around. That's where they're going to um, have the manure. Then you would actually collect the hay and compost that. So you can collect it um, every couple of weeks and go ahead and put it in the compost pile. Um, just again, be, be wary if it's really, uh, you see a lot of dust, you don't really wanna inhale that. I would wear gloves as well for safety. 
make sure you're washing really, really well um, afterwards um, when you do that. But this deep litter coop method is really um, important for us gardeners. So some other um, ideas, okay, if you don't want to just let them go, uh, which is the free range option, okay, you can use a chicken, chicken tractor and these can be large or they can be small. So the chicken tractor is one that moves. Um, you saw a large one from Paulette, but you can make a small one and just kind of move it around the garden wherever you're gonna have it. You can also put pens plus tunnels and gates. So kind of like what somebody was explaining, they have a, a run to their compost pile. You can have a run around the garden that just connects back to the coop. Um, you can have it, this one here, if you look at this picture, uh, this one's from Mother Earth News. They've actually got portable pins where they'll put that over the certain beds that they want the chickens to go in and then they'll just open the gate. So they're really um, kind of keeping them contained, but at the same time allowing them to go out into the garden and have the benefits of the garden. So if you haven't figured out already, the chickens are going to eat your plants, okay? Um, they may, if, 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 and mine, I will say, mine have not done this yet. I have tried to feed them kitchen scraps. I have tried to feed them plants and they're really not interested, um, but mine are fairly little. So I just, I give it time. Um, so I wanna time the chickens again in the garden. You might use raised beds. Again, some of your girls uh, are not going to hop up into the beds. They're just gonna kind of stay on the ground. And that's really, they'll, they'll do that weed control for you. They'll do that insect control for you. Uh, you might consider wire baskets on the plants. And I threw this picture in here because I, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, this one is from Gardener's Supply, the little bell-shaped uh, wire cages. Um, I don't know how well those actually would work I think I would probably build something a little bit sturdier uh, that they couldn't knock over or dig underneath, but you get the idea, okay? You can also do the perimeter garden uh, run. And so if, if any of you are our big Joanna Gaines fans, uh, she was the one that did the fixer upper show. Uh, I, I have garden slash chicken envy of hers because she has a very nice garden that has a, a beautiful run around it, kind of like this one. Um, and they actually will do a lot of insect control uh, just by having a run around the garden. So that might be another option uh, if you're interested in that. And fairly easy to build. So another great thing about chickens is that they dig, <laughs> which is good and bad, um, but if they're in the beds, they actually will till it up for you. And so again, if you time it right, um, maybe you've spread some mulch and you wanna incorporate that in. Uh, I mulch with, with hay. And so they're, they're helping me kind of till that in, um, it's at the end of the season, uh, and moving that in the beds for me and kind of moving and aerating the, the soil for me. Uh, so they're really, really good at that. I threw a picture of my daughter in here. Um, she gardens <laughs> in, uh, as Elsa, um, Princess Elsa, if, you're, if you don't have kids, um, which I don't usually like her to do because again, her dress can get dirty, um, but I threw this in here because it has little sparkly things on that dress. You can see them and the chickens like sparkly things. So they constantly are trying to eat her dress. But keep that in mind, if you have anything, um, any soil that you've added into your garden that maybe has perlite or vermiculite in it, those are both natural products. So if they ingest it, it's not gonna hurt them um, necessarily but it's not something that um, they will kind of start picking at it. And if, it's, if it, you've got your annual flowers, for instance, they will dig those up for you because they'll constantly dig at that and, and pick at those. Um, and again, new seeds, anything like that, they will pick at those. So just, just know that you might have some little holes in your garden. Now, some important things to consider, um, plants and scraps to avoid. Now, you can give your chickens the kitchen scraps, Instead of putting them in the compost pile, you can take them directly with chickens and then collect the manure. Um, but there's a few that we, we do recommend avoiding. So for instance, onions. Um, onions can make the eggs taste like onions if they eat too much of it. Important uh, is the nightshade family. So the nightshade family includes eggplants, potatoes, uh, tomatoes, and peppers, which I don't have on here, okay? Um, those, the nightshade family is toxic to animals. 
So really, if you, if you read a lot of literature, it says you should take um, those plants out of the garden before you let the chickens in. Uh, you'll notice my garden, all of my tomatoes are still there. <laughs> all of my eggplants are still there. All of my peppers are still there. Um, and and the, the chickens have been fine. We have enough stuff, they're not bothering the plants. Um, and if they eat you know, one leaf, it's not gonna hurt the chicken necessarily. Like Paulette said, you have to eat it in, in a good amount of number, but you don't wanna be feeding them the plant material. Not necessarily the, the fruit, but it's the, the leaves and stems uh, that we don't want them to eat, okay? Avocado skins and pits, um, they should not have those. Green potato skins, uh, raw rice, um, so not cooked, okay? Uh, that can expand uh, in their guts. Bean plants is another one they should not eat. And then rhubarb is another one uh, if you're up north, okay? So just keep that in mind. Uh, again, I haven't, I watch my chickens. I haven't had any problems yet with them going after these plants, but um, if it becomes a problem, I will certainly pull them quickly. Now we all wanna have our chickens as pest control, um, but newsflash, they don't actually eat every single bug. They're kind of picky, um, believe it or not. Uh, and they have to be quick enough to catch the grasshoppers and such, which mine are not. So uh, they do like grasshoppers. They're really good at squash bugs. They love squash bugs. Uh, caterpillars is another favorite, um, but if it doesn't move, my chickens won't find it. So with the caterpillars, I have to find the caterpillar for them and then I feed it to them, uh, which they love, by the way. Uh, they will eat ants, um, grubs like, like this one here. Now keep in mind grubs uh, are baby beetles. So that's what you're, what you're looking at there is, uh, could be an ox beetle, it might be a mass uh, chafer beetle, june beetle, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, they do eat ticks uh, quite well, actually, uh, and they like things like crickets uh, also. If you watch your chickens, rarely will they go after things like bees, uh, wasps, and butterflies. Uh, they just tend to know that bees and wasps probably aren't the best thing to eat, um, which is, which is kind of nice. But that's why we have them is for, for pest control, and, uh, and they do do a good job. Um, whether they're in the garden, outside the garden, or if you're keeping them pinned all the time and you find the caterpillars or whatnot and you want to throw them in, uh, that's great extra protein for them. So a little bit of research. Um, the chickens fed alfalfa or flax sprouts produce eggs with increased levels of omega-3s, vitamin E's, vitamin A's, and lower cholesterol. And I put this on here because we're, we're going to move into kind of supplemental feeding, um, kind of how to incorporate gardens or, or gardens that you grow for chickens, okay, into um, their diets. So some fun things that you can do uh, for your chickens, you know, maybe you don't want them out in your garden and that's fine. Um, you know, I weed and then I throw them the weeds so that um, when it creates that, that tillage that I want on the bottom of the coop, uh, gets the weeds out of my garden and they're not all over my garden when they can't be in there. But some other fun things you can do is you can consider growing sprouts or microgreens just for your chickens. Um, and these are really, really fast crops and, and super easy and they, they love them. So sprouts, um, these are just some examples, okay? So uh, you might have uh, other choices and that's, that's fine. But um, sprouts you can grow uh, in a container that's set into another container so the top container would have some holes in it, uh, a little bit of a paper towel that you'd wet, uh, grow the seeds in there, and then once they sprout, that's when you would feed them uh, to your chickens. Microgreens is this picture behind on this slide. Uh, it's a tray, uh, usually of a real light uh, soil, um, and then you're gonna really densely seed that tray. So very, very densely. Uh, I usually use a top on mine, um, so some kind of either it's, um, you know, some kind of lid. Uh, To-go containers from restaurants work really, really well for this. Um, put a lid on it, uh, you've wet it, sprayed it down, uh, and it, in a week or so, you're gonna have little sprouts. Wait till them, or microgreens, wait till they're about five inches tall, and then um, I usually just take the whole tray out to the, to the chickens, and then, that way they can scratch through it and, and eat it, but, um, or you can cut it, it's up to you.
but these are fun things to do for the chickens um, that are quick and uh, provides them a little bit of greens. Another fun thing you can do, um, Paulette mentioned if you have a run or a coop and say you don't want to let the chickens out, that they will eat everything in that area, including the grass, which they really, really love and it is good for them. Um, you can actually create frames. So uh, this is a picture here of, you know, it's a just two by fours and it's got a little bit of chicken frame on it or a chicken wire on it or hardware cloth actually. So it's, it's allowing the grass to grow through so the chickens aren't eating down to the root level. And so they're not killing the grass, it's just getting tall enough where they can eat it and then um, allowing the grass to regrow. So this is a, a neat way to kind of, to provide them an area where um, it, it will not kill the plant. You can also go ahead and if you're gonna leave the chickens out of the run for a little bit, um, plant the run very densely, kind of like those microgreens I was talking about. Um, again, just let them get about five inches tall or put the flats that you've uh, grown into the run with them. Here's a picture of uh, that kind of area that this person's created um, before they let it grow and they seeded their area. So if you wanted to seed it with ryegrass, for instance, during the winter, uh, maybe you don't have a lot of other grasses growing or your weeds aren't really growing, uh, you could use something like ryegrass uh, and just put over uh, or put these frames over it and let it grow up and then let the chickens out. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of keep it going without them destroying it. So some interesting things that um, I wanted to talk about and there's, I'm kind of wrapping up here, but there's, there's not a lot of research on this, okay? So I'm gonna start with that. However, it's, it's very interesting and there's a lot of people that, um, that do this. Uh, and so I, I felt like it should be mentioned. Uh, and this is from Bonnie Plants. Um, and I have these, these books here. Uh, and these are some that I, I like or I use. Um, this is from Lisa Steele. She is, uh, has a TV show and some radio shows. Uh, she's a master gardener um, somewhere up north, um, but she's in, big into chickens. So I actually enjoy the, the gardening with chicken book um, probably the most out of all of these. Um, but, but she uses herbs in her chicken's diets. Um, and I thought this was fun because some people, you know, maybe you wanna have a, um, a little window box next to your chicken coop, okay? Um, or a little garden next to the, the chickens that you're growing herbs, but maybe you're also growing herbs for the chickens, okay? So some suggestions that uh, you might have in that chicken herb garden uh, would be oregano, um, which is a natural antibiotic, okay? And you're gonna feed that fresh. You might have sage, um, you might have bee balm and mint. So mint's kind of fun because it lowers body temperature. Uh, you can actually freeze it in ice cubes and it, it will cool when they're, so chickens like to play with stuff. So if it's hot outside, we mentioned it being so hot, you can freeze little treats for them and then, and then put it in their water or um, put it out and they can uh, play with it, okay? Here's a picture. And this is from uh, Lisa's website, Fresh Eggs Daily. So you can see she's got some herbs and flowers and, and ice cubes. So marigolds is another good one. Um, the flowers, um, edible for people as well, okay? Thyme, uh, parsley, and lavender. Which I think it's really funny because they talk about stress relief and, um, <laughs> you know, again, I have kids. Well, I, I was just thinking when I was putting this together, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, in, I'm gonna end up in my chicken coop with my chickens because of all their wonderful herbs and the stress relief that they have going on <laughs> because I'm gonna need that. So that's probably where I'll be hiding um, along with the lavender and the, the marigolds and the thyme. So uh, I thought this was interesting though. I wanted to share this um, because we are, you know, wanna give you research-based information. And I really, really liked this website here. Uh, and, and it's Poultry DVM. And if you go to this website and say you click on um, cilantro, for instance, it'll bring up the plant. It'll kind of tell you a little bit about um, how it would benefit the chickens. And then underneath that, it gives you all of the research studies related to that and um, in the, in the poultry, okay? So it, it kind of backs up what it's talking about um, through research. Uh, and if you read, I thought aloe vera was particularly interesting because if you read a lot of the websites, it says chickens should not 
have aloe vera, um, but then there's some research that shows that they do have benefits. Um, and most of that's medicinal like you would for, for people. But uh, again, I thought it was really, really interesting. And if you're one of those that, that's interested in this and incorporating some herbs into the garden um, and wanting to share with their chickens, um, you know, or maybe you have herbs and you wanna make sure that they're okay for your chickens to eat, uh, we did certainly did not give you a list or a complete list of poisonous plants that uh, for your birds, okay? Um, but most of the herbs that you're gonna use in the, in the kitchen, uh, the normal ones, those are fine for your, for your animals, okay? So don't forget to stop and enjoy your chickens. Um, this, is, this is, again, I'm feeding my birds weeds here um, because they like crabgrass. And then uh, I know Jeff is on, uh, he's one of our master gardeners, but um, I hope he doesn't mind. I shared his chicken picnic table that he just built his uh, girls. <laughs> um, so uh, it's really just a little feeding tray and this is, would be a great place to put some of those herbs and, and fun things, but um, he has a little, little picnic table that, um, you know, it's just fun uh, to stop and, and enjoy them uh, and, uh, and take time to, to spin with your, your chickens because they are a lot of fun and, and uh, you know, if nothing else, they will be pure entertainment for you in the garden. Uh, so one minute they'll be destroying your garden and the next minute, you know, they'll want to eat the bug for you. So, so in just in summary, um, we want to make sure we're keeping our chickens healthy with proper shade, nutrition, uh, and water. Uh, make sure that you're collecting and storing your eggs safely, um, that you're using manure correctly. Remember that 120 days. Um, if you do want to do manure tea, you certainly can, um, or chicken manure tea. If you were in um, Dr. Treadwell's organic presentation she did a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, she, she firmly said that's a great uh, organic way. Just make sure you're using the composted manure. Again, 120 days, composted, then make the tea for the garden, okay? Uh, watch your chickens. You know, not everything is going to work for everybody. But we hope we gave you a couple of ideas to think about of how you might want to incorporate the chickens in your garden. So whether you're fencing them out completely, maybe you're making a run around the garden, maybe you've decided you're never putting your chickens in the garden, and that's okay too. Um, you know, maybe you're just going to feed them the weeds and the chicken scraps. Uh, but it's kind of up to you and, and the level that you are willing to, to handle with your chickens in, in your garden, okay? Um, and then enjoying the benefits of your, your chickens. So here is our contact information. I put all three of our emails on there. Also our phone number for the extension office here in Columbia County and our Facebook page. Um, we do check that quite often um, daily. So if you have questions, you can email any of us, um, call us, you know, send us a message on Facebook, whatever you wanna do. Um, but do we have any questions on, um, on the chat that we want to cover. Let's see. Karen, this is Maxine. Everything looks good on here. Okay. Um, Joanne has one question. Can your chickens get any illness that would make the eggs bad to eat after being cooked? Want you to answer that question? Yeah, so Typically the answer to that is no, because if you could, well, hold on, if you cook it to the proper temperature, so that's going to be your biggest thing there. If you're, like we talked about, the sunny side of eggs, you know, there is a chance, but if you cook it to that 160 degrees and make sure that you have firm oak or yolk and firm white, then um, it should kill pretty much anything that could be there. Okay, and Susan has a question regarding composting. The hay with the manure needs to be compost in the pile as well for 120 days? Correct. So if it's, if it's fresh manure, um, now, say you've, now say you've taken off the bottom of your um, coop and you're doing deep, deep tillage and you've left it there for a couple of weeks, um, you, could, you could theoretically count that as well because you're going to take from the bottom of the pile, so you're flipping it. Um, and then taking them from the bottom. So you could deduct those days. If, you, if you're collecting every month, you could go ahead and say, okay, this is, I know this is from a month ago. Um, so I only need to use it, you know, in this many days. That's fine. Um, but just kind of aim for that. We definitely don't recommend using um, fresh. That's the, that's the trick is, is the fresh stuff because of the diseases 
and then also you can really, really burn your plants. Um, so we certainly don't want to do that. Uh, and then I did put a poll on here uh, just at the end, um, if you guys would fill that out for us. <laughs> so you want, somebody wants to know where I can buy, buy I, I raise tiny dinosaur signs. Um, I make my own. <laughs> um, you could probably get it on Etsy somewhere. And with that, once you guys do the survey, we, we appreciate, um, let me move it over. We appreciate you guys um, hanging in there with us. Um, we will have, we're taking a break next week, but we'll start up again um, with hydroponics after that. Um, and uh, I believe Maxine's doing that one on the 5th. So uh, look for that uh, link for the class. And we will post this on YouTube um, by Friday. <laughs>